Hi, my name is Kristen Dobson, and I'm the Program Director for Research and Policy with the International Human Rights Funders Group. And this session is going to focus on another aspect of the human rights landscape, which is funding for human rights. Uh, maybe another elephant in the room. Uh, so what I want to start with is sharing some research that the International Human Rights Funders Group and the Foundation Center have recently produced on the scope and landscape of human rights grant making. So referring to this, earlier this year, we released the first ever data-driven study of how much funding is going to support human rights work worldwide. And we focused on a, a, a piece of the pie of funding for human rights. So we looked specifically at giving by foundations. There's also giving by bilateral, multilateral donors, uh, funding for human rights that comes through crowdsourcing, but we focused specifically for this first iteration on foundation funding. We found that 703 foundations based in 29 countries made over 12,000 grants to almost 7,000 NGOs, totaling $1.2 billion in support of human rights work. And just to provide some, some context to those numbers, the Foundation Center each year does an analysis of how much funding US foundations are giving to a number of different issues. They found that uh, foundations in the U.S. gave about 3.5% of all of their funding to human rights. Education was 19%. Um, environment and animals, they put them in the same category, was 7%, <laughs> which is interesting. So to just give you a sense of, of what the context of those numbers are. Um, next slide. So this research is part of a multi-year effort to track how much funding is going to support human rights work and then to create tools that both human rights funders and advocates can use to be more strategic and effective in their work. So we're calling this our Advancing Human Rights Knowledge Tools for Funders Initiative. Next slide. So just for those of you who aren't familiar with the International Human Rights Funders Group, we are a global peer-led network of foundations that give money to support human rights work uh, around the world. And we're committed to supporting foundations and being strategic and effective in their giving for human rights as possible. We have 350 foundations that are part of our network, and about almost 25% of those foundations are based outside of the United States. Uh, and then about 1,200 individuals who are part of the network, most of whom work at those foundations. And then the Foundation Center is a US-based nonprofit that's one of the leading sources of information on philanthropy and fundraising. Next slide. Uh, and then each point. <laughs> Uh, so the reason that we started this research it, about four years ago is we found that there wasn't any quantitative analysis of how much funding was going to support human rights. The information that we were operating with was mostly through relationships between funders and just having a sense of, via anecdote who's doing what within the field. And so we wanted to ensure that we had a very clear picture with both a quantitative and qualitative analysis of what the state of funding looked like so that funding could be a strategic and effective as possible. So there are five core goals for this initiative. The first is to increase knowledge about global human rights funding by issue area, by population, by geography, to promote increased coordination, collaboration, and transparency, both among human rights donors, but then also start to build bridges between human rights funders, education funders, health funders, and really understand uh, what those connections are so that funders are increasingly coordinating their efforts. And then, as I mentioned, to facilitate more strategic and effective decision making, and then really to establish a, a benchmark so the report that we released just a few months ago really sets a baseline for the field so that we're now going to be able to track trends in human rights giving moving forward. And one example of this is the research that we released is based on 2010 data. And what we're going to be able to see through future iterations is philanthropy's response for, to the Arab Spring, as an example. We found that the second least funded region for human rights was the Middle East and North Africa in 2010. So we'll really be able to see if that changes in 2011 and 2012. Next slide. So I did want to focus a little bit on methodology because I know there's going to be from this audience a number of questions in this area. 
So one of the first things that we did is we pulled together an advisory committee comprised of eight human rights funders that came up with a definition of what do we mean when we talk about human rights grant making. And this through, a, as you can imagine, a multi-month process and a lot of consultation with various actors, they drafted a definition that focuses on three core principles. One is that human rights grant making is in pursuit of structural change. And it's almost always on behalf of marginalized populations and in pursuit of the advancement of rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and subsequent covenants and conventions. So then the Foundation Center took that text-based definition and they matched it to their grants classification system or their taxonomy. So then they ran every single grant we had in the data set against this definition and coded it uh, to see whether it met the human rights definition or not. So in this process, we found that there were a number of areas in the Foundation Center's taxonomy that weren't accurately capturing areas of grant making. So then we added six new codes to their classification system. Uh, as an example, we added environmental and resource rights as an area of grant making in their taxonomy. We added sex workers as a population group. We added freedom from violence. So that also is ensuring that we're able to capture grant making those areas more accurately moving forward. We also brought in the scope of data that we originally had to work with. So the Foundation Center has the largest repository of information on philanthropy from US-based foundations. And they're increasingly uh, capturing information from non-US-based foundations. Even, that, even with that being the case, when they started, they only had data on 22 of our members. So we engaged in extensive outreach to increase that to about 150 of our member foundations submitting their data. And then we took those and uh, within the whole scope added it to all the information the Foundation Center had available. We also conducted interviews with 25 human rights funders based in nine countries to get a sense of what they saw as trends within the field, challenges and opportunities. Uh, and then I also wanted to share a little bit about the limitations of the research. So one is relation to the scope of the data. As I mentioned, the Foundation Center has traditionally collected information on US-based philanthropy. And as we know, human rights grant making is global in nature. Uh, so what we did is, through that extensive outreach, we focused on collecting data from non-US-based foundations. But there's still a ways to go with that. And that's a huge priority of the project moving forward, to collect more data on non-US-based grant making. Another limitation was with the quality of the data. So as you can imagine, foundations track their grant making in a number of different ways and in differing levels of detail. And so uh, in some cases, we'd receive information like this grant was to support human rights work in Kenya. It tells us where it's going. It tells us it's for human rights. But it doesn't tell us the specific issue that it's supporting. Uh, another area was around grantee safety. And this was one of the biggest concerns that we were grappling with in this research. And so in some cases, uh, as one example, LGBT rights in Uganda, it would, be, it would put the grantee in danger to tell us who that particular recipient was. And so how we handled that is that we listed the recipient as anonymous. Uh, would usually put maybe the country which the recipient was based and not put anything about the city, and then generally that it was to support either human rights work or women's rights work or LGBT rights. Next slide. So what did we find out? In terms of who's making human rights grants, we found that 703 funders based in 29 countries made at least one grant for human rights. Almost 93% of those were based in North America. And again, this finding really does strongly relate to the fact that that was a lot of the data that was available and that we're prioritizing moving forward trying to collect data on more non-US-based philanthropy. Uh, and found 4% were based in Western Europe and then 1.3 in Latin America and less than 1% in other regions. Next slide. Who are the top 10 human rights funders? Um, information I'm sure a lot of people are quite interested in. So the Ford Foundation tops the list at almost $160 million for human rights in 2010. Open Society Foundations is also right up there with Ford as the two leading human rights funders. Then Atlantic Philanthropies is third. 
And one of the most surprising things for us in this research is that we found that a number of the funders on the top 10 list don't self-identify as supporting human rights. Uh, for example, you know, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation wouldn't necessarily call itself a human rights funder, but it's hard to argue with their focus on diversity, inclusion, and equity, and ensuring access to education for children in poverty that that isn't a human rights issue. Next slide. So I also wanted to show top 10 foundations by number of grants, because I also think that's really interesting. You see OSF and Ford also at the top of the list, but a number of other funders, the list is actually quite different when you look at number of grants versus number of dollars. And a number of the funders on this list utilize a strategy of making more smaller um, grants to support grassroots groups, uh, such as the Global Fund for Women, American Jewish World Service, and the Global Green Grants Fund. Next slide. So where do human rights grants go? Uh, so this was also a surprising finding for us. We found that 54% of funding went to support groups uh, to hum doing human rights work in North America and primarily the United States. And one of the reasons we're seeing this is exactly what I referenced with the list of top 10 funders, that there are a number of foundations based in the US that are making grants that wouldn't identify their grant making as supporting human rights, but those grants met the definition for this study, such as access to education, access to health. They're framing it more in terms of a social justice, maybe a human dignity lens, but not a rights lens. But again, those grants met the definition. 16% uh, of funding went to support work globally. So this could be, as an example, a general support grant for Human Rights Watch would fall within this, or uh, for an international organization that works at a global level that the grant wasn't to support a specific project. And then Sub-Saharan Africa at 9%, Latin America at 7%, uh, with the Caribbean receiving the least amount of human rights funding at a little less than 1%. Next slide. So this is also an interesting way to look at the data. It's looking at recipient location and the focus of the funding. So for, as example, if you look at, let's see, Sub-Saharan Africa, what this is showing is that the funding going to support human rights work in Sub-Saharan Africa, two thirds of that funding went to NGOs based in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the other third went to organizations based outside of the region for work within that region. Uh, so you can see for most of these, it's about two-thirds of the funders are based in that region, with the exception of the Caribbean, which only 20% of the NGOs working on those issues are actually based in the Caribbean. Next slide. So what do human rights grants support? Uh, we found that the, and all of these areas break into a number of different uh, rights issues, but these are kind of the meta-level categories we use to categorize it. We found that 36% of funding went to support individual integrity, liberty, and security. So you may be wondering exactly what does this mean? Uh, so the area that was included under this is right to equality that was receiving the most funding in this area. It also includes freedom from discrimination as another category. And the reason for this relates to the way that the advisors crafted the definition. They specifically chose, with the definition of human rights grant making, not to name specific identity groups, recognizing that the rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and subsequent covenants and conventions apply across all identities. So it actually divided out by issue area, not identity. We can still look at how much is going for LGBT rights and women's rights, uh, but the way that this issue area breaks down is that any grants that were for LGBT rights, women's rights, disability rights, that didn't name a specific right were captured within this right to equality, which is one of the reasons why this area is so large. Human rights general is also at 16% which doesn't seem particularly helpful, but what's falling in here are grants that I mentioned with the concern for grantee safety, where it's just saying to support anonymous in Burma for human rights. Um, all of those grants are falling within this category. What also is falling in are general support grants to human rights organizations, that the organization works on a number of different issues. And then you see health and well-being at 10%, sexual and reproductive rights at 9%. And some of the least funded areas are civil and political participation at 3% and environmental and resource rights at 3%. Next slide. 
I wanted to show you a picture of one of those areas, environmental resource rights, a little in greater depth. So we have in the report that we just made available, we dive into 13 different issue areas and look more specifically at who's funding this issue, how much is going to each region, what is the breakdown by population. So as an example for environmental resource rights, we see that 3% of the funding is going to support this area, that of that funding, 21% of that funding was in support of indigenous peoples. 16% uh, of that specifically named women and girls as a beneficiary of that funding. Next slide. So I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail because a lot of these concepts came up on the previous panel, but when we spoke with funders about what they saw as some key factors influencing human rights philanthropy, there were three main areas that came up. One is shifting global power dynamics. And this is referring to the increasing power that the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, Nigeria, South Africa, have in terms of expressing their voice on the global stage and being influential in the global human rights debate and what role funders have in terms of supporting that. And wh how, what does that look like in their strategies? Are they supporting organizations based in the global south within those countries to influence their governments, to be involved in the global human rights debate? Is it supporting grassroots organizations in those countries so that they can influence their own governments to be promoters of human rights and sort of violators of human rights? So those, that was one area that came up. Almost every single funder we spoke with really remarked on this change. Another area which came up in the first panel is non-state actors. And the increasing role of non-state actors, not just corporations, but paramilitary groups, international financial institutions, and what role non-state actors have in terms of being violators of human rights, but also potential promoters of human rights. So one example, uh, with relation to this research is in 2011, Google announced that it was making $11.5 million worth of contributions to ending human trafficking. We found in 2010, the entire field gave 15.2 million so to end human trafficking. So if one actor in one year can give pretty much almost three-fourths of what the entire field was giving in the year previous, I think it just shows the opportunity for further engagement. A third area was around technology and organizations using technology as a tool to advance their work and advance human rights, but also seeing governments increasingly using technology to repress human rights and what role do funders have within that dynamic. We also asked funders to comment on what they see as opportunities within the field and challenges that are being faced. One of the key opportunities was building an active constituency for human rights. So a number of funders we spoke with felt that the field hasn't done a particularly good job in making human rights relevant and the message compelling for people's day-to-day -day lives. And that they're facing negative, increasing negative public perceptions of human rights, uh, increasing government backlash, closing spaces for civil society to operate, we're seeing new, newer legislation in Russia and in India limiting receipt of foreign funding, what that means for local civil society movements for human rights, and then also this, which I mentioned, this messaging component. Another opportunity that came up was breaking down silos. And so this is making connections within human rights funding, ensuring that human rights funders are talking to each other, building upon each other's work, but also making connections across funding sectors. So this relates to the opportunity that we really see about there were so many funders based in the US giving money to support work in the US that they wouldn't see as human rights, but we see as in pursuit of structural change on behalf of marginalized populations. And so making sure those funders are speaking with kind of the core of the human rights funding community. And then the third area is engaging with potential new sources of funding. So the funders we spoke with had varying opinions as to whether what the role of funders in terms of donor advocacy, but you know the potential for raising funding from diaspora communities, high net worth individuals in some of these emerging economies, uh, governments within emerging economies, how they could be potentially uh, new actors in terms of funding for human rights. Next slide. So what's next in terms of the research? There's an, a number of things we're working toward, but I wanted to just highlight two areas. 
One is doing exactly what we're doing at this conference, sharing the findings of the research as we recognize it's, it is initial research and we very much want to build on it. So asking for your feedback um, and also helping funders and advocates really utilize these tools and the research within their work. And then conducting outreach to more fully understand the extent of human rights giving. And this is in relation to the point that I mentioned about the scope of the research and ensuring that as a next step, we're going to start tracking bilateral, multilateral funding for human rights, which we recognize is a huge portion of funding within the field. Uh, and then in future years, maybe focusing a bit more on individual giving for human rights as well. And I want to end there with the presentation portion. And then I'm, I'm very happy that Louis Bickford and Larry Cox are going to join me here. We're going to have more of a roundtable discussion about the state of human rights philanthropy and hear some of their perspectives as funders on what they see as opportunities. So if you both want to come up. I think we're both embarrassed that you have to deal with us again right after the previous panel. But anyway, here we are. I also feel weird, this big divide between us, so I'm going to move, I'm going to move, yeah, you know, yeah. Sure. at least partially. So I was hoping we could start by, because both of you wear a lot of hats, uh, as we heard from the previous panel. And so in, in this session, I want to hear a little bit more from the funder hat. So if you could both speak a little bit about the work that you're doing in terms of human rights funding right now. And if, Larry, if you want to start. Yeah, well, sure. Uh, uh, as uh, Louis already noted, uh, uh, I was uh, uh, a human rights program officer for 11 years at the Ford Foundation, uh, preparing the way for Louis to come and take my job. Um, <coughs> there, there were someone in between, but nonetheless, it was all about, you know, consciously I was aware that Louis was out there and I had to prepare the way. But uh, since then, I went back into NGO work and uh, was a, a grant seeker, which is something that I recommend that every person working in philanthropy do periodically to remind themselves what it's like to actually go seek money rather than give it. It was a very educational thing. And I then got recruited back uh, to work that I had previously helped to initiate uh, when I was at the Ford Foundation, which is the creation of a fund uh, for human rights work in the United States. We had an analysis which said that one of the striking things about the global human rights movement was that it was uh, uh, how the US thought that human rights applied primarily to other countries, but not to itself. And uh, that this was reflected also in among the donor community, that donors were not uh, seeing human rights as something which was relevant to their work in the United States. And we'll get back to how that seems to be contradicted by these findings. But, and so we started, uh, after much dialogue and discussion with, with uh, different donors, we started something called the U.S. Human Rights Fund, which was a pooling of money. Um, that, unfortunately, got hit hard by the 2008 uh, uh, recession slash depression. And uh, some of those donors had to drop out. And so we reconfigured that gathering. And we now have something called the uh, Sunrise Initiative for Human Rights in the United States, which is funding on a very small scale, unfortunately, uh, human rights work uh, in the United States. That's my, what I'm doing with relationship to donors. And there are five donors in that at the moment, one of which is the Ford Foundation. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how much detail to go into, and I'm maybe during questions and answers, if people want more detail, I'm happy to do that. The Ford Foundation essentially, you know, it's interesting to see the numbers up there uh, and, and think about how those were calculated because you, there is one way to measure Ford Foundation's contribution to human rights as, you know, very, very large, um, which it is here. Um, it's also, there's some definitional questions within Ford Foundation of how you, you know, what's human rights versus different areas. But um, 
but essentially, the, the way it works is that uh, we work in, in what are called initiatives. The initiative I work in is the Strengthening Human Rights Worldwide Initiative. Um, I have a lot of conversations with people in the Women's Rights Initiative, people in the LGBT Rights Initiative, um, other places within the Ford Foundation. Um, Strengthening Human Rights Worldwide is structured as uh, five portfolios. Um, to use the lingo within the Ford Foundation, the portfolio, my portfolio is called the Global Human Rights Portfolio, and then my colleagues within the initiative, I have one in Egypt, one in South Africa, one in Chile, one in India, and one in Brazil. Um, and so the six of us together uh, each have budgets which we, which we uh, you know, uh, give as, as grants to, um, to organizations and work together you know, more or less as a team. I mean, we have distance relationships, so it's, it's not uh, a perfect team, but we try and work together as a team to strengthen human rights worldwide. So that's the basic uh, structure. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous uh, session, my, the, my particular focus is on uh, organizations that are working internationally. And you know that can mean a few different things. Um, you know, I work with a group in Kenya that does quite a bit of work in Uganda. So they say, look, that's international. And it's true, it is, that's international. Um, I also work with Human Rights Watch, which has offices all over the world. So, um, but essentially the core definition of, the, of my work is international organizations. I also work with Witness, which is represented here today in a great organization. So, um, so that's, that's basically the, the kind of structure of the Ford Foundation's, at least my part of the Ford Foundation's human rights uh, grant making. And, you know, as you all know about grant making, even though, the, you know, I think it's common sense, but people <laughs> forget it a lot, which is that, you know, there are a lot of meritorious and amazing and excellent NGOs and projects out there. Um, way, 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 way more than we could possibly fund. And that's great. That's good news. That's one of the exciting things. But what that means is that you, in my position, need to develop a kind of a strategy for making sense of how to navigate all of those amazing uh, organizations and proposals. And so what that consequently means is that, you know, you think a lot of, you end up, you get into the job in part because you like saying yes and you end up saying, you know, no most of the time because there just, there are very limited funds. And so my, uh, the strategic approach that I, I've taken is really around social movement building as a global movement. So what is the international human rights movement? What does that mean? What does it even mean to be a, an international movement? As you can imagine, one of the first phone calls I made was to Catherine Sickink. <laughs> I called her uh, literally on my second or third day, and I, I've known her for a long time, and I just said, Catherine, I need your help in thinking about transnational net, uh, advocacy networks 15 years later or whenever. I can't remember when the, that book was written. Um, and she's, she's been helpful uh, since then in helping me conceptualize some of that stuff, as have a number of other people. Um, so I'm, I'm very much thinking about a set of questions around what an international social movement looks like and what its relationship is to national movements. Um, some of that is specifically because of joint grant making I would be making with some of my colleagues. So I maybe I have a couple of grantees in Brazil and South Africa, for example, that I'm uh, making as joint grants with uh, those offices. But, but on a much more important level, it's, that's really about, it's, a, it's actually an existential uh, uh, question about the human rights movement, is the relationship between the national and the international. What is that relationship? You know, there's, an, there's, there's sort of two poles on that. Um, the furthest pole uh, in favor of kind of national would say that there's no such thing as the international movement except to aggregate the national movements. That is, the only thing that matters is a national dri nationally driven agenda that um, because all, because it is in fact true that all meaningful human rights change takes place on the national level, right? So that the purpose of the international is purely to support the national. Um, on the other end of that spectrum is a set of questions that say, well, actually international organizations have a space, you know, that have to do with a set of international questions, a set of international institutions, a set of cross-regional sharing uh, questions, you know, that cut across regions, et cetera. And that's why, you know, some of the findings in this report are really interesting in terms of that set of questions, too. Like that's, I, you know, in the next part, I'd talk a little bit about that, you know, relationship, what it means for a U.S. organization to be getting, which is a significant number of organizations, U.S. organizations that are working internationally. 
as opposed to organizations in each of those countries that are working on their, on their own stuff. And that dynamic is in some ways, at the, the changing dynamic, I should say, is at the core of, of a lot of the stuff I'm thinking about. So that's a kind of overview of what, what's going on at the Ford Foundation. And that's a, that's a great transition to my next question, which are, what are some of your reactions to the research? Did any of the findings resonate with you? Anything that you uh, would want to contest or don't reflect what you're seeing in the field? Uh, well, uh, two, two reactions. First, uh, you know, just to remind people that when you look at the aggregate numbers, it seems like a lot. When you look at the percentage numbers, it's 3.5 percent, I think you said, of grant making goes to human rights, which is, if you think about it for a moment, is rather phenomenal because <laughs> these are the rights that every human being needs to be fully human, and only 3.5 percent of all grant making is going to that, which means pe people are probably dealing with a lot of the results of people not having human rights more than they are dealing with trying to guarantee that everybody gets human rights. So I think that was quite helpful and striking. The second thing, of course, from my point of view, as somebody who has been working on human rights in the United States, was that I don't believe for a second uh, that the number of, <clears throat> no, that there's a, uh, we don't have it up there, but the number on uh, human rights grants going for U.S. work is accurate. <laughs> uh, by that I mean, I think that's a definitional problem. Uh, I think if a grant maker doesn't know that they're making human rights grants, probably they're not making human rights grants. That would be my rule of thumb. They may be making grants on areas of work that are directly involve human rights and relate to human rights. Uh, but if they're not giving grants to groups which are actively uh, intentionally framing their work in terms of human rights, using human rights standards, uh, using human rights principles in the way they organize their work. By that I mean uh, uh, having the people most directly affected. My guess is they're not. All I know for sure is that those groups which meet that criteria, which are using human rights, which are organizing around human rights, are grossly underfunded and would be stupefied to learn that 54% that of all grants are going to human rights work in the United States. I mean, just, it's just so, dis the disconnect is so large that I think it's, uh, it, yeah, it, something's got to be wrong. Uh, what's promising about it, though, is that if there are groups that are giving money in areas that are, by my definition, obviously, uh, where human rights are completely implicated or involved, uh, but don't call it human rights work, that opens up possibly a chance to have a dialogue with those donors about why an explicit human rights approach could be more effective, more meaningful, uh, and, uh, and that's, that is a sign of, of hope, I think. Um, I, yeah, I mean, actually, the, the other number, so you mentioned the 54%, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of also fascinated by this particular set of numbers. So the other number is the 46% in other countries. I, I think that's a, a very interesting question. And it's also a question about the future and also ties into the question about, I think, about universities preparing people for work in, in future human rights work. Because I, my sense is that, that this will change radically over time. And, what, and here's what I mean. Right now, the funding community tends to fund, the U.S. funding community tends to fund U.S. institutions to work internationally, right? That's changing. That's really changing. It has to change. It should change. It will change. So that what will happen is the global funding community, which, of which the U.S. is a big part, will increasingly be funding international organizations to work internationally. Now that's, you know, not, maybe not great news in terms of the job market. I'm not sure, you know. I mean, in other words, I think um, there, we're not going to see a lot more of the big U.S.-based organizations hiring people. I mean, to put it in those terms, or just existing. You know, I don't think we're going to see. Uh, I think that, for example, if someone were to come to me today and say we want to start up a kind of human rights watch or we want to start up a, an organization, I would say, okay, well that's interesting. What, where, you know, what are you doing? And they'd say, if they said. We are working in the U.S. to try and frame health as a human right, and we're trying, you know, then I'd say, okay, that's great. You're working in the U.S., your U.S. organization makes complete sense, you know. 
But if they came and they said, we're a US organization and we've got a whole bunch of very excited and eager and smart, um, you know, super smart uh, uh, graduates from US universities and we're gonna start up a US organization to work in Haiti, my reaction would probably be, well, actually, let me go talk to the Haitians. Let me see what the Haitians are doing. And if the Haitians said, we're trying to start an organization and you guys never give us any money, I would be very sympathetic to that, you know, because it would make a lot of sense to support the Haitians who are doing the work in Haiti. So, so that's part of this that I think, you know, I think yeah. is going to be shifting. And um, I mean, I don't mean to wrap it up with the, with the job market question, uh, but I just know that that is interesting to some of the people in the room and in terms of the university uh, aspect of it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I guess the implication of that is that you know, certain percentage of training has to go to thinking about how to work in international institutions like perhaps United Nations or, or um, other aspects of the international system or to kind of bring the focus back to the US the way that Larry's been talking about and say, well, if we're a human rights organization in the US, you know, we can work internationally, but we may also want to be working on the US. So I think that's going to change over time, that, this uh, particular number. And any reactions to what came out of the interview study? So some of the, the themes that were discussed in the first panel around shifting global power dynamics being an area that's really changing the field, technology, non-state actors, um, or some of the opportunities in building a broader constituency for human rights. Any reactions to some of those findings? Well, one thing I might say on that is just to, to, to recommend to people, and I, I, I don't know how you find this. It's I think it's publicly accessible, the, the Fanton and I'm thinking yes. of the Fanton and, yeah. um, and Katz Nelson report. So there yeah. was another uh, study done prior to this report being released that was kind of a qualitative assessment of the state of human rights funding um, by Jonathan Fanton and Zachary Katz Nelson, which is also available online. Both uh, reports are available online, and I think they're both incredibly rich resources yeah. if you're interested in this area. And, he, and in that uh, report, um, which is called Human Rights at an Inflection Point, I think, um, in that report, he, you know, they do talk a lot about a lot of these themes as well. Um, and, you know, it's clearly in the zeitgeist. I mean, you know, you've, you've outlined in the report, I think, by the way, I think very helpful to read the report just as, as a piece of, you know, sort of a survey of human rights, the human rights field today. And you raise some of those challenges in the first couple of pages. I think that's worth looking at. And, and the, the Fanton Katz Nelson uh, report is also you know, builds on that. And, I, you know, it's worth looking at because of some of the, some of their predictions, like they, a prediction that's different than one I just made about U.S. organizations, but is related, is, um, you know, they anticipate, they think there are too many small human rights organizations. And that's, that's an interesting question, too. Um, I don't know if I agree with that or not, actually. I'd have to think about it some more. But, I mean, one of the things they say is that, um, that the kind of, this is, goes to the grassroots, grass tops question, you know, and where human rights advocacy is most powerful. I think they, they feel that um, because of the professionalization of the field uh, as, as one opportunity and also because of the way that, you know, human rights battles get actually waged, that, we, that there's a, a kind of ten tendency towards stronger, more, you know, stronger, slightly bigger organizations instead of a proliferation of smaller organizations. So, I mean, I don't, I don't actually have a strong feeling on that, but it's an interesting thing from they say. In terms of, but, yeah, I mean, that's, that's all I'll say. Can you clarify where to find your report? Yes, so the, the Advancing Human Rights report that I shared the findings from is available if you just would Google Advancing Human Rights Foundation Center, it will bring up the report. The, the Jonathan Fanton piece, I know Atlantic, I think Atlantic Philanthropies yeah. had published it. If you just Google Jonathan Fanton, human rights at an inflection point, it should come up. Yeah. Um, but I'm also happy to share links with both the reports with Joel if there's any way of disseminating that. Yeah, I, well, I, I, you know, again, my reaction was a little bit uh, incredulous um, in the sense that I'm not sure that where they say they are, are you know, concern building human rights constituencies. Uh, these are the, the sort of future opportunities, right? Building human rights constituencies, breaking down silos. I'm not sure how well that fits with the actual practice. Uh, you know, and I can only speak personally and other people can maybe then join in. But my experience with donors is that there's been an increasing trend of donors uh, to, to, uh, on several fronts that I find that, that differ from the time when I was doing philanthropy 
which was now about a decade ago, I guess, or more, a uh, decade, 15 years ago. Uh, so I sound like an old person who can't remember, but that's because I am. <laughs> uh, 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 which are really troubling. Uh, one is a sort of obsession with metrics in the sense of, uh, which is understandable. I mean, you know, you want to give money, you want to get results. But, but that has taken the form of really, as I said in the earlier session, uh, wanting uh, people to get very specific results in a very specific set of time as opposed to, the fee the, to what Ford Foundation used to be very proud of, which was building a field and, and then letting the field decide what the priorities were in terms of issues and getting results on those issues, but really feeling if you had a vibrant uh, field out there, that was going to produce things. Uh, and related to that, that tendency now to, to force NGOs into looking very narrowly at, at issues as opposed to cutting across silos and building broad constituencies. Um, uh, you know, there, there's uh, the related tendency to become more and more engaged with determining yourself as a foundation what NGOs ought to be doing. <laughs> you know, it used to be that we prided ourselves as a foundation, I'm talking about Ford now, on finding really excellent people and excellent NGOs and then following their lead. They were the ones to do the analysis of this is what we need, this is what we're doing. And this was both true uh, domestically in the U.S. but also true uh, in terms of other, other countries and following their lead. Increasingly, my experience has been that donors are more and more deciding they will set the agenda and then they will find the NGOs which sort of match their agenda. Um, and I think this has had a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, has been very difficult for lots of NGOs which have the choice of either we stick to our analysis and we don't get funding or we, you know, we give in and we say, all right, we got to do what these donors want us to do. And, it, and that raises the larger question, of course, which is, the one of power and uh, power relations between NGOs and, and, and philanthropy. So I just raise that as something that sort of counts, goes against what, you know, the, I, I hope that that's correct and that they really are doing that, but my own experience wouldn't lead me to think that. Sorry. And how, and can we move into Q&A, let's say for 10 minutes? Sure, sure. Um, so let's move to Q&A, and I will also, I'll jump in with one other question that I had, which I wanted to ask if you see any gaps in terms of issues, populations, geographies that funders aren't paying adequate attention to. Um, so I'll just throw that in, and then we'll take a few questions. Um, right in the back. And don't ask for a grant. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's not a problem. Ford has already announced they're pulling out. Um, <laughs> no, so I, I'm speaking on behalf of a local human rights organization in Jerusalem, an Israeli organization, and as the numbers show, the Middle East in general is not getting, I'm speaking specifically on sort of Israel, Palestine, not getting significant foundation support, but what is sort of missing from that is that there's a huge amount of support from governments, um, UN agencies and then the European Foundation support that is coming is often has a back donor that's a government. And going back to the obsession with metrics, what it's really doing is forcing organizations to projectize our work and the way we look at ourselves. And so what happens is we make everything about the metrics that can be reported and we're forever saying, okay, we made this amazing achievement in 2011 where maybe we know the reality is that in the grand scheme of these sort of overall pictures, we're inching towards areas. And just if there's any room for a donor voice to say this is not, this is creating a huge power imbalance between the donor and the recipient and how it's changing how we work as organizations, um, particularly in areas where there's not perhaps the core support that there used to be and it's sort of becoming more and more a government funding relationship where I think perhaps Jerusalem's more unique than in some areas that's so heavily funded by government entities, but how that changes how we work and how we analyze ourselves because we don't really do many, okay, what did we do in the past 15 years because there's not, there's no incentive for us to perform that, that analysis of ourselves when 
nobody who's been around, say, 15 years ago may even necessarily be there now to know about that or care about that. Let's take two more questions. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Rashmini. I'm from the Organization for Visual Progression. We're based in Sri Lanka. So based on the experience I have working in Sri Lanka, what I've noticed is um, when donor organizations, they sort of pull out from funding certain countries, um, they just say, okay, sorry, from the next quarter or from next year, we won't be able to fund you guys. And that makes, for a small, it, that makes things very difficult for a small organizations. Um, so what would you guys suggest, you know, when when an organization just pulls out like that, a donor organization, and when discontinuing the groundwork that you do is simply not an option, um, as a group of funders or people working for organizations which fund um, other NGOs, what do you suggest to make this transition a bit less difficult, you know, sometimes when they just say, sorry, we can't. Do you think um, connecting them to other organizations or providing supporting links would help? Because in the case of Sri Lanka, that really doesn't happen. So, yeah, what do you... And one additional question. Uh, I'm Matt Maroon from... Uh, uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Dayton. My question is, uh, this morning I've been uh, hearing uh, quite a bit about uh, connecting, especially to developing countries and, and empowering more of the, the NGOs and the, the local force that's there. And so my question is really to go to the, the grassroots versus grass tops comment that came. Um, when it seems like the process that, um, that you all, and, and no different from other organizations, Spearhead, is uh, so cumbersome that uh, you need an expert to be able to, to navigate that. And on the previous panel, uh, they talked about, uh, some, one of the, the speakers talked about um, how maybe larger NGOs could partner with uh, you know, some of the developing countries, whether it's their governments or, or NGOs that are in there, uh, to be able to connect in those kinds of advocacy things. So I guess my, my question is about grant making. Um, how are the folks who are in those developing countries going to connect with uh, the grants that come through you when you know, very explicitly you need a grant writer on staff most of the time to be able to even open the door into your, yeah. you know, sure. how does the, the police officer that is involved in the child trafficking, you know, stopping child trafficking connect with your money? How does the next Mother Teresa who is in Africa scooping up uh, orphans from the streets connect with your money when he or she can't access your systems? So what, what's the future there in that? So we have a number of questions, one about gaps in funding, one about suggestions for when funders transition, uh, when funders pull out and NGOs need to transition, another about how the obsession on metrics and then how uh, organizations in the Global South can connect with foundation money. Do either of you want to respond, Louis? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, maybe starting with the last one. Um, uh, I mean, I think that that's I think that is changing, and that's part of the calculus of of exactly you know what we spend a lot of time thinking about these days. Maybe it's you know in in many ways it's it's pretty late in the game, but I mean I think it is something that's being thought of a lot uh, in terms of making making creating those those partnerships, those those um, kind of links. So, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's. Um, if if the approach now there's so many different ways to approach grant making but you know one approach that and the reason you saw the different numbers between Ford and OSI there uh, is in terms of numbers of grants made OSF is because um, uh, you know Ford tends to make larger grants to slightly bigger more established organizations right now that you know that can be seen as a slightly risk averse approach it can be seen as you know not um, really feeding the kind of um, uh, grassroots side of the movement as much, et cetera. So there, there are critiques you can make of that. It's, you know, it's, it's a decision that grant makers have to make about how they're gonna, how they're gonna position their funds. But by doing that, um, it, it helps with, a little bit with the problem you're talking about because then there's, um, you know, you're really engaging with a, a, a kind of flagship organization that does have those kinds of links. Now, you may be perpetuating a problem, which is that they, the, I mean, the big danger of that is that you get a conversation that goes between the elite national organizations and the national, and not one that goes between the international and the grassroots. So there are, you know, problems built into that. But, but those groups do tend to be, you know, pretty well connected and, and have, 
and have linkages to those international systems and know how to navigate them. And, and it's not just by happenstance. It's because they are, you know, they've, they've been around for 20 or 30 years. You know, they've, they themselves teach, you know, they, De Justicia in Colombia is an interesting example. De Justicia, it's only been around about 10 years, I guess, but, it, but a really strong, interesting organization in Colombia. You know, both Cesar Rodriguez and Rodrigo Primni teach at Universidad de los Andes, run international seminars there, have PhD students working on the international human rights movement. Cesar has, you know, comes up to teach at Brown uh, once a year for three months and has a visiting professorship at Brown. They've got that academic connection. Then at the same time, they, they are working, you know, with grassroots communities and publishing op-eds and very visible in Colombia as kind of human rights representatives in Colombia. So they are a group that I think really does a very good job of spanning that exact thing. And if, you know, if you're a more grassroots group and you have a question about how does this thing work, they're a resource and they're there and they see themselves as a resource for movement as a whole in Colombia and Latin America. So um, the, um, yeah, I mean, I can come back to another one. Yeah, well, let me just f follow up on that. I, I think one of the Again, there are tendencies in philanthropy uh, which need to be resisted. To go to your first question about a donor voice, there are donor voices that, of course, are critiquing philanthropy. We need stronger donor voices. It's like everything else where you speak out against the people you're working for or the field you're working for. There are some risks, you know. Uh, but we need it because we need to figure out how to find a way to, 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 for those voices to have that discussion to do the same critique about philanthropy within philanthropy as we did with human rights today in this conference because uh, there are, as I said, some very troubling trends and people are aware of it, you know. So, you know, I'm hoping, you know, Louis will be one of those voices that will, you know, risk his job and, and uh, <laughs> uh, give it up if he has to, uh, to speak out. One of the trends, though, that I, again, is that uh, speaks to your thing about uh, how, how, do, how do you deal with these small groups in places that won't know how to access, is that Ford used to be very good about investing in a high proportion of sort of program officers to, to grant seekers, which a lot of got critiqued by a lot of other, uh, like, uh, like Gates, saying, uh, we're not going to do that. We're not going to hire a lot of people. We're going to give our money away rather than spend it on program officers like this guy, you know, we're going to spend. The problem was that in doing that, they almost guaranteed that they're going to be giving money to people that they already know, that already have connections, that are already tied, and the groups that may be doing fantastic work on the ground are not going to be known. And the only way you can do that is by having people in the field who, who really are in touch with uh, work that's going on on the ground to, and who will work with the grant-seeking community there to help them maneuver the system. So I think it's one of the one of the tendencies that has to be resisted. It's worth the investment in philanthropy to put people on the ground, uh, just as it is worth the investment for human rights organizations to have people who are actually in dialogue with their so-called partners. Um, and that's a that's a very important uh, uh, investment uh, uh, that that needs to be made. Otherwise, you're just going to be, you know privileging the, the same groups o over and over again. I just want to say one other thing about the small grant versus large grant. These things also show you how they change. I mean, you know, there was a time when Ford actually had the opposite philosophy, where they gave a lot of small grants. Partly if you were cutting back on the number of program officers, giving a lot of small grants is like doubling your workload. You know, it's, you know, I used to know a guy who was a program officer who gave two grants a year. <laughs> and the rest of the time he could go to conferences, he could like, you know, hang out at the bar. I don't know what he did, but, you know, where I was trying to spread the wealth to as many groups as I could, I was giving like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of grants. I used to think, well, I gotta figure this out. Uh, but, uh, so that, you know, but I think the, the real question is, how do you hit that balance between uh, giving uh, people more, as we used to say, just enough money to fail? That used to be what we used to do. We'd give you just enough money so you could fail, but we wouldn't give you enough money so you could really take off and, and grow. And again, that requires knowing who, who's ready to really take off. It requires having people on the ground who can do that assessment. It requires taking a fair amount of time 
So if you're making a zillion grants, you don't have time to figure that out. You need to do that. Um, but I, I think uh, it's not so much a question of how many grants, it's a question of whether the grants are strategic and whether you're really giving people enough money so they can actually do the things that they, that they want to do or you're just out of whatever, pressure, guilt, whatever, you're giving them some money but not enough money so they can actually accomplish what they want to do, which I used to do all the time, so that's why I'm, so, I'm critiquing myself. Um, on a couple, of, just a couple of the other points, I mean, you know, the, the, the transition question, I mean, is it just an incredibly hard question? I mean, it, there isn't an easy answer to that. I mean, you know, there are mechanisms you can employ, you know, as a grant maker to help with that problem. You can do tie-off grants over a longer period of time. You can do, you know, you can, and this, and, you know, we do this all the time. We say, okay, we've been giving you, a, you know, a grant a year, but now we're not going to anymore, so we'll give you three times the amount for the next three years, and you have three years, and that's you know you have three years to figure out the problem. But you know, and, and it's strategies shift and focus. You know, you, where you're focusing shifts, and I, it's I don't have a good answer for it other than for grant makers to try and be as sensitive as possible to that, and to try and you know work with partners to make that work. I mean, the other answer is around the idea of of strengthening philanthropy globally. Yeah. Um, and, and rising the tide so that, you know, if you leave, yeah. you know, there are other funders there. And, you know, what I mean by that is not simply looking to try and get more, instead of more funds from Ford Foundation, now getting more funds from Oak Foundation, or instead of getting more funds from the Swedes, getting more funds from the Danes. What I mean is, you know, looking to new models of philanthropy, yeah. thinking about individual philanthropists, uh, trying to mobilize some of the amazing, you know, wealth in the world for these kinds of things. Um, and there, you know, there are efforts like that. We have, um, that we've contributed to actually, yeah. you, probably during your time, the yeah. Brazil and the, uh, the Brazil Human Rights Fund and the Arab Human Rights Fund, which were meant to um, attract uh, regional, uh, either individual philanthropists or other forms of uh, mo donor money into regional funds that could then be used. And, you know, I do think that Human Rights Watch, it's going to be important for us to follow what Human Rights Watch is doing in their fundraising department in their international offices. And I, you know, I, I mean, I think, I'm sure, I don't know if Joe's still here, but I'm, you know, okay. Um, you know, it is, it, it could go either way. You know, it really could go either way. And it's, it's tricky. I mean, one possibility is that the city committee model, I don't know how many people know about this, but, you know, one of the great, one of the reasons Human Rights Watch is so, so visible and so important is because they've been profoundly successful through something called city committees. And then that, in turn, helped to attract the big Soros money that came in. But um, the city committees are, you know, committees of, you know, you should, and as you mentioned, you're on the Chicago City Committee. So we have examples here. I mean, this is a, a fundraising mechanism, but it's not purely fundraising. It's also to bring more people into the organization to attract, um, I would say, general elites, I would say, from, from different cities around the world. So they're now proposing to do that in, in Sao Paulo or Brazil, for example, um, and I guess Johannesburg, et cetera. Now, one of the net results of that is that is fresh funds. Nobody's getting that money right now. Nobody's getting it, so they're not taking it away from anybody else. And part of the possibility there is that they will help to nudge individual philanthropy in those countries towards, towards human rights uh, type organizations, including domestic ones. But we don't know. Or so. the other possibility. Uh, the, or the other possibility <laughs> is that um, that will not work as well, and, and then, then there'll be comp more competition between the groups in terms of funding. And with that, I think we're out of time, but I would encourage anyone to come up and ask any questions you have about either the research or human rights philanthropy in general. Thank you so much. Okay.